It's the 19th century, and Qing China, one of the largest empires the world has ever seen, is having a bad time. Being plagued by numerous rebellions over the past decades by the Han Chinese majority have taken their toll on the Qing, but it still stands strong as the largest and undisputed power in Asia, so long as nothing goes wrong. By George, just who is there? Foreigners have always been a thing in China, for most of its history, and the Europeans were nothing new. What was new was something called global empires, and this would spell the doom for the Qing. Relations with the European powers have always been strained, with the Russians expanding to the north, to keeping the trade to one port, to seeing as foreigners as inferior to the Chinese. So you see, China has some exports that are not available anywhere else in the world, and the Europeans like rare things. To purchase these, however, the Europeans had to buy at a ridiculous price, so to make some of their money back, the British had a brilliant idea. Why don't we smuggle opium into the country and create loyal customers to offset the amount of tea we need from this country that we're all buying up? Lin Cheshu, a scholar who relied on moral thought, openly criticized the opium trade, blaming it for poisoning the country in return for honest wares. He would take charge in the confiscation and destruction of opium in 1839. This would royally piss off the British and lead them to pull in all their merchants from Canton and redirect ships to the Chinese mainland. The British would arrive at the island of Zoshan and shell it and within nine minutes take it over. The first opium war had begun. While sailing up the coast of China, the British delivered a peace officer to the emperor, and the emperor for the most part ignored their demands, which basically legalized the opium trade and demanded to be viewed as equals by the Qing government and just decided to replace Lin Jishu instead with a man called Kishan. Kishan promised peace to the British, but took way too long, so the British got bored and decided to beat the Qing at the Battle of Chunpi instead. This brought the Qing back to the negotiating table, where the British demand reparations, being seen as equals, permit the trade of opium, and most importantly, the seizure of Hong Kong. The Qing, still believing they could win this war, canned Kishan and replaced him with Yishan and Yan Fang, a latter who didn't last long as he permitted the British to trade in Canton again if they took Big Stigari army away. The ensuing battle would see a largely outnumbered British capture the city in about a week. The pattern would continue with many of the port cities being captured and ending with the capture of Xinkang, effectively cutting off the food supply route for the country. This would lead the Qing to suing for peace, and the resulting Treaty of Nanking would, would see trade allowed in Shanghai, Amoy, Ningpo, and Fuzhou as well as in Canton, opium included. Oh yeah, and the Manchus would have to cede Hong Kong again. This became known as the first unequal treaty, but wait, there's more. Back in the 1830s, a man by the name of Hong Jiquan believed he was the brother of Jesus Christ. Yes, I know how that weird that sounds. He became an influential figure, preaching and speaking out against the Qing dynasty, and promising social and land reforms. After gaining thousands of followers, Hong formed the Taiping Heavenly Kingdom in Guangxi. The Qing would attempt to suppress the revolt before the situation got out of hand, and failed. So things got out of hand. Fast. He would march his forces east to Yongyang, and the Qing would fail again to suppress him. This would culminate in the heavenly forces breaking the siege and sacking major cities wherever they went. And they also burned opium as it was against their beliefs. I'm sure the British will be understanding there. In 1853, they would capture Wuhan, an important city in the region of Hubei. Taking gold from the city as well as boats, they now had a navy. They used this navy to capture Nanking, which they then made their capital. They would then march north to Peking, Beijing, but had to retreat due to constant harassment by the Qing forces. The Qing could not capitalize on their enemy's failure as the Nian Rebellion, a Muslim revolt in Yunnan, the Nepalese invading Tibet, the Chan Rebellion and the Small Knife Society's revolt was keeping them quite busy. Oh yeah, and did I mention the British declared war on them again starting the Second Opium War? They would declare war due to the seizure of one ship registered in Hong Kong. The Qing would attempt to give back the ship, but the British leaders wanted war instead. So began the war. Just a quick note, Parliament was very much against the war. The French would also join in as they smelled opportunity. They would sail up the Pearl River and shell Canton, again, and capture it, Again, they would follow the last war's plans of sailing up the coast, destroying defenses wherever they met. This would result in the emperor suing for peace, and gave Europeans right to trade with China. The Russians would also sign the Treaty of Aigun, taking much of Manchuria, notably the port now known as Vladivostok by the end of the conflict. 
When the navigators went to Beijing to negotiate a peace, they were tortured horribly. So you know what that means, more war. The coalition would land and take Beijing in famously looting and burning down the Summer Palace. The peace would see the aforementioned land ceded to Russia, the ratification of the previous treaties, and more land ceded around Hong Kong. The Taiping Rebellion continued, but things weren't so peachy either. Two of Hong's subordinate kings started a brutal civil war within a civil war for good measure. The new powerful men behind the Heavenly Kingdom would launch an attack on Shanghai, leading to the Europeans helping the Qing fight the rebels. Under British supervision, Nanking would be put under siege and the rebellion crushed. When entering the city, the Qing found out Hong had already died. However, this did not stop the rebellion immediately, which had killed 20 million people. The Qing would go on to lose Tonkin in another war with the French. However, the next kick in the face of the Qing was not that far away, as Japanese, now under a unified centralized state, went in Korea, which had been a Chinese tributary for centuries. They had already forced Korea to open its ports to the Japanese militarily, but the rebellion occurred and the Qing came to assist the Koreans, which led to all Chinese being expelled from Korea. The Japanese then pushed into Manchuria, where they would defeat the Chinese on several occasions. After capturing the city that would become Port Arthur, the Japanese would land in the Shandong Peninsula, taking major cities there and sinking the Chinese fleet. After a failed counteroffensive and the capture of the Pescadore Islands near Taiwan, a peace was signed, turning over the Laodong Peninsula and Taiwan while eff effectively making Korea a Japanese puppet. Things were possibly looking up for the Qing with the rise of the Boxer Rebellion. The Boxers were an anti-imperialist rebel force who were against foreign influence in China. They would rise up with 100,000 to 300,000 men to make China great again by killing Westerners and Chinese converts to Christianity. Initially, the Qing intended to suppress the rebellion, but after the Boxers threw their support behind them, they were more than content to let them go. The Boxers then marched on Beijing, but the merchants in the foreign quarters asked for assistance in quelling the uprising and, you know, saving their lives. Only 400 troops were mustered for their defense, and brutal combat commenced. Seeing as this small force was not enough to crush the rebellion, a coalition of the United Kingdom, France, Germany, Italy, Austria-Hungary, Spain, Belgium, the Netherlands, the United States, Russia, and Japan was formed and marched from Tianjin to Beijing. The Qing saw this as an unlawful invasion. The coalition was defeated in combat by the boxers and sent back temporarily. However, this victory also came with the 100,000 men Russian invasion of Manchuria. By August, the now bolstered relief force entered Beijing and defeated the boxers. A peace was signed which hurt the Qing even more and war crimes were committed on both sides. In total, around 100,000 people had died, some brutally and slayed without remorse. By this point in time, mass civil disorder was rampant in the nation. Something had to change. The Qing, fearing the change being the end of them, attempted several reforms known as the late Qing reforms. They didn't really go so well. After some intrigue gone wrong happens with the Empress dying and her successor being mysteriously poisoned, a regency was set up for the new emperor, Puyi, the Jiantong Emperor, who was two. Under a two-year-old, China could only prosper, right?